motion boat on the banks today is the trawler. It's the most modern of all deep sea. Yet the origin of the use of the trawler in fishing is very old. Trawl fishing was known in England as early as 1376, and the use of the trawl may have been introduced much earlier than that. What makes the trawler distinctive is the enormous net she tows. This net, streaming out behind the trawler, drags over the sea bottom where ground fish, such as haddock, cod, and sole, feed. They are, in this way, swept into the mouth of the net. Stretched on the ground, to get an idea of its size, the net looks like this. The open end, from 80 to 100 feet wide and 30 feet deep, forms the wings of the net. The wings of the net are laced to the heavy rope at the bottom, called the foot rope. The regulation size of the mesh in the wings and belly is from 4 to 6 inches. This allows the smaller fish to escape. Where the parts of the net are joined, the twine is doubled. At the cod end, the mesh is heavier, smaller about three inches, and doubled for strength. The end of the net, called the cod end, will hold 5,000 pounds of fish. Before putting to sea, there is a lot to do. The pen boards are cleaned and returned to the hole to form separate pens to hold the fish. It's important that they be clean or the fish will spoil. Ice is crushed and stored in the ice hatch near the fish holds, ready for use when the catch is brought in. Enough stores must be put aboard to last the crew a week or more. The engine room is the heart of the ship. Today, most trawlers are diesel powered and have diesel electric driven winches. The engineers must be competent and alert for the success of the fishing depends in no small degree on their skill. Because the trawler is so highly mechanized, it takes a relatively small crew, 18 to 24 men, to operate it. Just 180 miles from the coast of Nova Scotia are the well-known fishing banks. These are shoals where the water is from 25 to 100 fathoms deep. Bankerow, Middle Ground, Sable Island, and Grand Banks are the better known ones. And as the trawler steams on her way, the captain plots his course on the chart, marked to show depths of water and location of fishing grounds. While on deck, the gear has to be made ready. Any breaks in the warps must be spliced. Markers have to be set in the warps at regular intervals and the warps run back on the winch. The markers enable the winchman to know just how many fathoms of warp have to be run off when setting the trawl. The winch controls the fishing gear and demands skillful control by the winchman. The biggest part of the gear is the net, which breaks often by the continuous wear and tear so the crew must be skilled net menders. All the way from port, the mileage indicator ticks off the knots the boat is making from her home port. The echo sounder measures depths that can be checked with the chart if there is any doubt in location. And records of mileage and location are recorded every four hours in the ship's log. They are nearing the fishing grounds now, about 180 miles from the coast of Nova Scotia. It is two o'clock as the captain brings his ship to a stop and the crew gets ready to shoot the gear.
The door on the forward gallows starboard is brought over the side and shackled. So is the aft starboard door. Then the cod end, the belly, and the wings of the net go overside in that order. And the net streams out to windward as the ground warps a run off the winch. With the trawler now running at half speed, the hanging doors bear the strain of the net. Then the engines are stopped while the doors are dropped simultaneously. As the trawler speeds ahead again, the gear shoots aft and to the bottom. The door is spread apart and the forward door is well abeam. Now the messenger hook is thrown over the forward warp and slides down under the water. Attached to this hook is a cable which is drawn in by the winch bringing the towing warps together to the towing block on the after rail of the ship. The man at the towing block locks the two towing wires into position. and the messenger hook is removed. The warps are usually let out three times the depth of the water. And when the markers on the warps are even with each other, the dragger net is in correct towing position. Note how the net lies in towing position in the water. The door is spread apart, dragging on the bottom and the fish sweeping into the net. The net drags over the banks for an hour and a half. By means of the radio telephone, the captain is able to keep in touch with his home port whenever necessary. And while the net is dragging, the crew is mending broken nets. It is 3.30 now, and the captain gives orders to haul the gear. The towing block is released by knocking out the pin. As the warps are hauled in, the ship circles, retaining enough speed to keep the net coming in at towing speed. The forward door is now brought up, unshackled, and hung in the gallows chain. So is the aft door. The warps are then wound up on the winch drums. The wings of the net come up first. Note the tears in this net that will have to be repaired before setting again. The quarter ropes close the net and bring bosom and square over the rail. The wings and bosom of the net are now hauled in by hand. If there is a good catch, the cod end now floats to the surface. But there are many yards of net still to be hauled on deck. This is hauled in by winch with a rope called the lazy decky. The cod end holds 5,000 pounds of fish, but only 3,000 pounds with the splitting strap on. This strap is attached to the cod end to allow a small bag of fish to be brought in at one time so that the strain will be taken off the cod end. <laughs> 